Hello everyone, welcome, good afternoon. Um, my name is Chris MacDonald, I'm the Head of Research at Pancreatic Cancer UK. It's my pleasure today to be able to kind of conduct this uh, virtual fireside chat and Q&A session with uh, Dr. Pilar Acido from University College London uh, and one of the key researchers in the Early Diagnosis Research Alliance that Pancreatic Cancer UK fund. Um, so we're here today um, because you guys uh, um, all supported our double donations campaign uh, last year, and that's fantastic, and thank you so much for doing that. However, I think it's probably safe to assume that you guys are also here today because you know the realities of uh, pancreatic cancer and its early diagnosis, and its diagnosis uh, all too well. Um, I don't think I need to repeat this often, but 80% um, of people who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer are diagnosed at stages three and four, far too late to be able to receive um, effective treatment options. Uh, and this translates into really terrible survival uh, as five-year survival for people with pancreatic cancer only being 7%. So um, we think this is unacceptable as an organization and as a charity. And we invest a significant amount of research spending into tackling the challenges of early diagnosis and detection and supporting the research community to be able to drive the changes we need to see improved and better and earlier diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And we're only um, set to increase in our funding of early diagnosis research as well in our upcoming five-year strategy. Um, but more is good, but um, more spent in the right places is even, a is even better. And we want to be able to put our investments in areas that truly effectively change the, uh, the, the, the world of research with regard to early detection and diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. So we really try and focus on key challenges that, are, that stand in the way of our research community from, a change in, from, from achieving those real changes in pancreatic cancer. So when we fund, we really want to fund in certain ways. So we want to enhance and, um, and, and support true collaboration in the research community and build a network of researchers to be able to uh, minimize the amount of duplication, but to enhance the things that we are able to invest in with ourselves in the UK more widely. We also want to attract and retain the best and brightest researchers in the field of pancreatic cancer, early diagnosis research. We want to provide the research resources, so those are the, the samples and the data that's absolutely necessary to drive all pancreatic cancer early diagnosis research. And we want to enable the community to really to, to develop pragmatic tools and, and tests to use at the right place at the right time for every person who's diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So we truly make early diagnosis a, rea a reality for those individuals. And I think one example that really embodies all of those different aspects of our strategic approach towards early diagnosis research is PCUK's Early Diagnosis Research Alliance. And I can genuinely talk all day about the Early Diagnosis Research Alliance, but I'm not going to because Pilar's here and she's going to be able to talk to you from the kind of, from the coalface of, 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 of the Early Diagnosis Research Alliance. So I'll, I'll shortly hand over to Pilar. But I just want to say a massive thank you personally to all of you who have supported the double donations um, um, campaign. The, um, I don't often get the opportunity to say that to our supporters very regularly. Our, our fundraising team like to keep me away from every, people as much as possible. But it really is incredibly important. It's incredibly important for the charity to keep on investing and to increase our investments in early diagnosis research. And it allows me and my team to be able to support the brilliant and dedicated researchers that are the people who drive the change in early diagnosis research, the likes of Pilar and her colleagues and team in the Early Diagnosis Research Alliance. So speaking of which, speaking of brilliant and dedicated researchers in the area of early diagnosis uh, research, I'd like to be able to introduce our, um, our so um, Pilar Acido, I'm just trying to make sure that I get your title, your new title correct, Pilar. So it's Dr. Pilar Acida, who is the junior PI, so principal investigator and co-head of the Pilar uh, Pereira Lab at University College London, and one of our key researchers in the Early Diagnosis Research Alliance. And with that, I will hand over to you to do a little presentation, and then we'll follow that with a bit of Q&A. Pilar, over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, and, and hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today. I cannot thank uh, enough all of you for your support, and I will be repeating this during my whole presentation and later and later again. Since I moved to the UK, um, I also want to thank Pancreatic Cancer UK for all your support and for the invitation to be here today. As a junior investigator, I think it's really important to say thank you to the people supporting, uh, supporting you. And also it's really important for us to share what uh, we have been doing. Thank you to your donation. So I am delighted to be here today presenting the Early Diagnosis Research Alliance. So as uh, Chris mentioned, I am uh, Pilar Acedo. I am a junior principal investigator at University College London, Royal Free Hospital. So I am a senior uh, researcher and I, I have a PhD in, in cell biology and genetics and I joined UCL in 2015. And since then, uh, why I joined UCL is because I wanted to do more translational research. And what do we understand by translational research? Is this type of research that you do in the lab in the bench, but you are hoping that is going to have an impact on, on patients' outcomes. So we are trying to move anything, any, any findings that we find in, in the bench, in the lab, to, to, to the clinic. So uh, for that, my current research focuses on the discovery and validation of um, biomarkers for the early detection of pancreatic cancer, but I am also involved on projects investigating novel therapeutic strategies to improve uh, response to therapy. So if you want to know a bit more of what um, I do, uh, thank you to, to your support and Pancreatic Cancer UK among other charities. I have a Twitter account, so um, I will be delighted if you follow, uh, follow me and my team for updates on, on our um, research. And also uh, I, I wrote here my email if, in case if after the session you have further questions or you just get, uh, want to get in touch. Um, so yes, I don't do all this work alone. Of course, we are an alliance and I think all the people in this alliance is just fantastic. And I work alongside with my colleagues in the Pancreatic Cancer UK Early Diagnosis Research Alliance or EDRA to move our funding, uh, our um, findings yeah, forward. But what is EDRA? So EDRA is one of the biggest investments in pancreatic cancer early diagnosis in, in the UK. And I have to say that this is all, uh, thank you to us, uh, supporters like, like you. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here and, and, and to support um, my, my job and to allow me to do what I really love, that is a science. And as researchers, we are shaping um, a, 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 the, the future of early detection. We are sharing information and knowledge, and we are coordinating efforts and working together to develop and implement a, a simple test, but that is accurate enough that doctors can use to diagnose pe people with cancer earlier. So our main aim is to um, saving lives. So within the, the Alliance, there are uh, four um, different projects, but the pro projects complement each other because we are cooperating to accelerate the impact that our uh, results can have in, the, in, in patients. So one of the, uh, the first projects um, focuses on creating a biomarker test to accurately detect pancreatic cancer so the Alliance has created already a test in the laboratory that is highly accurate uh, detecting pancreatic cancer. But of course, this was created in the lab. As I mentioned, we are trying to have an impact on, 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 in the clinic. So the next challenge is a kind of a big one is to make sure that our test that is accurate in the lab is also accurate or, or outside the lab uh, setting. So in the clinic can be at the primary care or secondary care setting. Um, some other part of the, the researchers at, uh, at the Alliance are developing a bank of samples uh, from people with vague symptoms. And we can discuss during the Q&A a bit more why um, getting samples from people having or presenting in the clinic with vague symptoms is, is key and is making our cohort of samples unique. So what we do in, in this project is collecting samples from people with vague symptoms. So those um, who uh, have similar symptoms to those diagnosed with pancreatic cancer to help researchers like us with uh, the experiments and to validate the tests that we are uh, developing. There are uh, other researchers um, in project number three evaluating how we can get the test to work in the NHS. So it's very important to, to make sure the test um, that we are creating is cost effective and can be easily implemented in the NHS. And there are other researchers improving tools, uh, focusing on improving tools and um, use 
uh, by GPs to identify people who uh, may have cancer. So as you know, GPs have already some, some tools that they are using to um, detect different types of cancer, but we would like to improve these, these tools so they are better at detecting pancreatic cancer. Or also we are working on creating new tools that can act as, um, as a alarm system. So imagine you have patients that are match, ma matching some criteria, a specific criteria. So then a, a, a red flag or alert is made and then um, it's indicating the GPs that further investigations are, are needed. But um, this alliance is, is big, is, is, um, including, is including many, many researchers around the, the UK. And I have been mainly focused on, over these years on sample collection and storage, and also um, evaluating uh, samples from patients with the symptoms to, de um, to develop the um, test um, further. So I have helped creating this biobank or, of, or bank of, of pancreatic cancer samples. So we are having and collecting uh, blood and urine from the patients that we see in the clinic. So people already um, having pancreatic cancer, but not only, as I mentioned before, we are also collecting samples from people with vague symptoms. So symptoms similar to those uh, with pancreatic cancer that are not diagnosed. So it's a really unique biobank because it's a pre-diagnosis pre um, biobank. So people, we, of course, we know the diagnosis for the patients, but just after we have been collecting the samples. And I am sure you are aware of the typical vague symptoms associated with pancreatic cancer, making early detection really, really um, complicated. So some of the symptoms that we see in the patients coming to our clinic are abdominal and, and back pain, change, changes in bowel habits, nausea, weight loss, jaundice, and new onset diabetes. So these samples are used by researchers like in our team or in the alliance or in, in new collaborators to um to help to develop in the lab uh, to some tests and, and to validate and before uh, going to the clinic because the test before going to the clinic they need to demonstrate that they are really accurate so we aim to diagnose the disease at an early stage so we are also uh, studying a bit more and um, some of these vague symptoms associated particularly with pancreatic cancer and for that is really important um, collecting samples from people with vague uh, symptoms. So I thought it was nice uh, to show you a little bit how our <laughs> um, um, daily life in the lab works like, uh, looks like. So we have an amazing team, I have to say, um, working on sample collection. So we are collecting samples, like my team in, um, is focused on, on Royal Free Hospital and University College um, London Hospital. And we um, collect samples like urine and, 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 and blood from gastro clinic or HPV clinics, endoscopy, endoscopy clinics and multidisciplinary diagnostic centers. Something kind of really, we really follow a really, really a strict protocol to ensure that the samples, like the quality is really high because um, I know and there are, and there have been some issues validating some other tests because the samples were not stored properly. We are super strict with that. So um, it's really nice to, because our clinics are in the same hospital as our labs. So we don't need to ship the samples. We just go some flops upstairs and uh, another part of the team um, is working on processing the, the, the samples and then I am I ensure that the samples are properly stored um, in our freezer that is also located in, in the same hospital. And just sharing some of the data that we have so far, so we are really, really happy to, to let you know that we are doing great, I think, taking into account a pandemic over the last few years that we have been recruiting more than 1,700 samples from patients diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, but also um, uh, patients with vague symptoms. And we collect blood or urine. And sometimes we have, uh, we aim to collect both type of samples uh, from our patients. And we are also collecting um, uh, information to better understand the symptoms associated with these samples. And I think it's also interesting to check a little bit closer the diagnosis breakdown that we, we got out of all these samples. You see here in red and that, a lot of our samples as, as are associated with pancreatic uh, with pancreas diseases. Uh, we have uh, pancreatic cancer, but we also have a lot of cases with uh, pancreatitis. So this is making this cohort really unique. But 
We also, even if the patients have been referred to our clinic because they are presenting symptoms that are um, increasing the risk of developing pancreatic cancer or associated to pancreatic cancer, we also see other conditions and diseases of the bile duct, the bowel, or liver. So we are now trying to better understand um, symptoms associated to pancre pancreas disease and, the, and, and validate uh, some of our markers. So these samples have also helped to create a um, high, highly accurate blood test in collaboration with different partners and researchers in the Alliance. And the samples are, are available to the whole research community, promoting the establishment of new collaborations. As Chris was saying, we aim to collaborate, to share information instead of being competing, because it's the only way to move um, uh, to have an impact on patients outcomes and the biobank is an amazing resource and, and means that more projects can happen and i am also happy to say that new projects are starting soon this year and, and will um, in, enhance the knowledge that we have in pancreatic cancer early detection so in summary thank you to all your support thanks to all your support we have been um, able to or all your help has been able to drive forward early diagnosis research and is getting us closer to, to have um, a, a test, which I, which I think is, is just fantastic and really exciting. But I don't do all this alone. I said that the Alliance is huge. Um, is, is huge. We have um, researchers from all over the UK, but in particular, I, I just want to say thank you to, to my team. As Chris was saying, I am a junior PI and I am um, a colleague, a colleague in this group. Uh, thank you to uh, Professor Stephen Pereira here in the photo, who is a gastroenterologist. And because we both wanted to do translational research to, to have a real impact on patients, I think basic scientists and clinicians need to work together. So I am lucky enough to be part of a multidisciplinary research team formed by both basic and clinical scientists. And this is our Twitter account also, if you want to follow our um, research. And yes, I, I am now uh, leading the basic science uh, translational research program of the group, but I am also involved in several translational studies in early detection. And I just want to say thank you again to Pancreatic Cancer UK. When I moved to the UK, um, I just realized how great it is to work with charities and particularly Pancreatic Cancer UK has been really close to our team, has been helping us a lot. And uh, even and this is a photo of 2018 already. Um, I, I, I wanted to say thank you somehow. And I just organized a fundraising event called Dance Salsa to beat pancreatic cancer. And these are all my students. And we organized this night of salsa and we were able to um, raise more than 700 pounds that were donated to Pancreatic Cancer UK. So thank you very much. But it has been also um, a pleasure and a fantastic experience to be able to work. Thank you to Pancreatic Cancer UK with patient groups. As a scientist, I think this is fascinating, super motivating. Uh, sometimes we are in the lab working many hours. Things are not, um, results are not as expected or we just need to continue improving a test, time consuming, challenging, but you know, having your support and then talking to you during summits and, 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 and you know, uh, going out there and, and realizing that this, what we do is relevant and important is just uh, amazing. So thank you, thank you very much. And it's, it's fantastic to work with the pancreatic cancer community as a whole. So I just want to, to say thank you to Pancreatic Cancer UK, to all of you for listening, for your support, because if not, I will not be in here today and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Fabulous, Pela. So interesting. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions. Uh, we have stuff in the Q&A already, and I have lots of burning questions, obviously, to ask uh, about, about this work. I just wanted to remind people that if you do have any questions, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your page and stick your questions in there, and we'll try and get to them. Um, try not to put any questions into the chat function. We're really happy for you to put kind of comments and things like that into the chat function. But if you could put questions into the Q&A, and that means that I can properly cover them uh, and, and feel I can properly answer them as well. So I really appreciate that. Any questions that we don't get to today, we promise that we'll either signpost you to the right place or we can follow up with Pilar afterwards and we can get, get you a written response and we can send them out as well. So don't worry if we don't get to them, we will get to them eventually. So 
Peel are fascinating. I love the early diagnosis research alliance. I think your work is fantastic. I just I want to drill down a little bit into a lot of the kind of focus of your work around the sample collection and try to, I suppose, help people understand why it's so important. And because you, you know, you take samples from lots of different people, vague symptoms of, of, of that can be associated with lots of different conditions. I suppose, could you help us understand why that vague symptom cohort is so important for the testing of early, early detection um, tests? And why is it different from other approaches normally adopted? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. So, yeah, first of all, I want to highlight that it's really important how you are collecting the samples and how you are storing them. So we have, as I said, a really strict protocol in place and we have been able to have the lab um, where we process and store the samples in the same hospital. I think this is really key because if you don't have this protocol in place, the quality of your samples can decrease and then this is going to be, you are going to be losing information. Regarding the second part of the question, like why um, getting all this broad spectra of people with vague symptoms is because before the majority of the studies were done uh, comparing cancer cases of pancreatic cancer with healthy donors. So people that they don't have any, any diseases associated. And we know that pancreatic cancer, you know, there are many uh, the benign, benign diseases that can lead or increase the risk of developing pancreatic cancer. And our tissues in our body, when they are healthy, they are totally different. The biology of our organ, you know, our pancreas is totally different and it's changing, right? When we are developing a disease. So of course, everything is easier if you are comparing healthy donors, or samples from healthy donors to pancreatic cancer cases. So maybe you are developing a test, it's really, really accurate, but then these are not the patients that we see in our clinic, right? So pa patients going to the GP, they have symptoms. And then the GP, after a few visits, are referring them to our clinic. So we really need to work with the real samples that we see in the clinic. And if we really need to be sure that our test is specific and sensitive enough with these cases. I see. So it's kind of like it's the most real life reflection of what your test needs to actually work in, I guess. That is, is right. I mean, I think it's like we are having working in these specific clinics where patients are referred with symptoms, but nowadays we cannot, dis cannot help us to distinguish pancreatic cancer cases from other diseases. And this is what we, we really need to, to uh, figure out, right? What are the differences between these patients? Because are the patients that need further investigation? Great, interesting. So I'm just gonna follow up on that sample collection um, bits and pieces. Um, Charles has asked a good question about, um, you know, do, is it this quite, um, do you collect your samples just from London? Do you correct, collect them across the UK? How do you actually get to people who are presenting with vague symptoms and collect those samples? Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic question too. So we started the project at UCLH and at Royal Free Hospital, as the two main hospitals, um, and setting up all this infrastructure takes time. So we were also optimizing protocol or protocols, but of course, um, there are many, many collaborators from other parts of, in the UK, so Glasgow, Liverpool, some other hospitals in, in, the, in the UK, um, Manchester, and you know, we're working all together, but instead of opening all the hospital at the same time, we were optimizing the protocol in London, and now we have um, uh, BARDS also joining in London, but we have also uh, Liverpool and Glasgow, and they are storing the samples following our protocol, and then they are shipped to our um, uh, our common uh, bio um, biobank. I see, I see. So, um, so when do you see kind of like regional variations in your in your symptoms, or is that something that you try not account for? Do you try and anon anonymize within like your vague symptom cohort generally? Yeah, we are um, we are evaluating even uh, changes in depending on the postcode. So okay. we are trying to go in really into detail. Oh. I, I am afraid I don't have the answer yet because we started earlier, like in 2000, 2018 in London. And now uh, due to the pandemic, everything was a bit delayed in sample collection in other centers. So London is the, uh, and UCL and Royal Free are the main ones. But yeah, we'll be in really interesting in the future when more samples are coming from those centers. And also we get more information on symptoms to compare them between different regions. Yeah, it will be really, really great. 
I see, I see. So um, expanding on that kind of like, you know, that wider network piece, you've obviously got samples coming from a wider network, but like what are the benefits for you from having that wider network in terms of the research and the alliance itself? You know, what are the benefits of actually having, you know, researchers looking at implementation scientists, how you integrate, you know, these tests into the AHS, but also, you know, colleagues that work in primary care setting looking at like referral tests what's the benefit of having you know different people and and different and different approaches that you would maybe not necessarily work with as a basic researcher yeah i think i think working in a multidisciplinary uh, inter, interdisciplinary team is key if we want to ensure that we are going to be implementing something um in the clinic so i think every person has a different background we Every as with a different background, everyone can see different challenges, and then working together. This is uh, with having people from different backgrounds is what can accelerate uh, implementing something in in the clinic. Also, we need to think that a tool that we are going to be implementing in primary care maybe is not the same one as we need in the secondary care. So we really need people or clinicians working in the secondary care level working together with the primary care. Basic science is trying to understand the limitations that the test can have. People evaluating implementation, what are the challenges in the NHS? Because if we are going to develop a test that is highly accurate, but really, really expensive, or that we cannot be implementing the clinic, what is the point? So it's better to understand all this at the first stage of your studies than later on when it's really late, right? Yeah, absolutely. I suppose it's the, the kind of balance of pragmatism within the system and knowing you know, how much the NHS and the people who work within it can really kind of adopt what you're trying to do, because sometimes early detection and biomarker work kind of herald these like really, really accurate tests, but in reality never really work in the context. So, yeah, I appreciate that pragmatic approach. I suppose just following on for that, you mentioned about primary care and GP settings. Is it something that you is it something that you um, an area of kind of focus and interest because of, you know, we, we know studies have demonstrated huge gaps between people get presenting their symptoms, but also actually getting then referral onto current pathways. Do you think that's a really important area for where research may need to go in detection and diagnosis? Yeah, I, totally. I, I think if we think that GPs are the main doctors who see patients with big symptoms, right? I think it's key working with them, trying to understand the challenges that they are facing, why, you know, the patients need to go to the GP several times and they are not referred earlier uh, to our clinic. It's challenging and, you know, it's really, really challenging. So we really need to develop tools that, you know, are, can help um, GPs to better know um, when to refer a patient and how to unsend them via the fast track um, pathway that um, we are in, having now. So, you know, it's, it's kind, kind of tricky because pancreatic cancer incidence is really low. So maybe GPs, so GPs are the main ones seeing this type of patients, mm-hmm. but maybe people at secondary care know m- much more about uh, symptoms or specific symptoms associated with the disease, pancreatic cancer experts, right? So yep. I think it's key. And if we really want to um, decrease the, the time be- between disease presentation and referral, I think we really need to work with uh, GPs to listen to them and see um, how we can help them to better develop tools uh, for um, yeah, selecting patients going to secondary care. Because it's one of those things, It's it, it, in reality, it may not be one single intervention that completely revolutionized it but you're saying it's actually a number of pragmatic interventions at the right stage in the right time in someone's presentation i guess yeah 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 and there is i, I don't know I'm, i am sure you know about it that the government uh, well there is a national country strategy plan and the government is focusing on on diagnose diagnose cancer patients earlier right to uh, 2025 um and there are some improvements in there is kind of challenging but we are also taking this into consideration so and there and the rapid diagnostic centers have been created so they are trying to speed up cancer diagnosis and we are part of of this um, we are one of these centers so we are trying to intercept patients with not specific symptoms that could indicate cancer between this primary care and secondary care so we are already working 
working uh, together. And there is this new uh, pathway, right? The two weeks wait. Yep. So if you have a specific uh, symptoms that flag, uh, flag the possibility to have a type of cancer, you are going to be referred within two weeks. But I think still, you know, we, we, there are a lot of things to do and we really need to work as a multidisciplinary team to address these challenges. Yeah, really interesting. I, I wanted to kind of expand a bit more outside of the vague um, symptom cohort in kind of primary and secondary care and think about people at risk of pancreatic cancer because we know there's certain people with very specific genetic mutations and family histories that have slightly increased risk. We know that new people with new onset diabetes and things like that have increased risk, people with chronic pancreatitis. So I was just wondering your thoughts around that. Do you think there's like to kind of, of the balance of like the people who present with vague symptoms, which are the majority of people, um, uh, people diagnosed, but you know, are there things that we could be doing with regard to those people who have a at risk group and how we can maybe get to them earlier as a possible through knowing that risk, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I, there are different um, screening programs for people at high risk of developing pancreatic cancer related to familial pancreatic cancer cases. So uh, people, as you mentioned, with different uh, cases of pancreatic cancer within the different generations, they are included in, in, into a screening program. And also people um, with a new onset diabetes is a really important um, high risk group. And we follow, follow them up. But now, nowadays, there is not something in place to really distinguish um, people with no new onset diabetes that, uh, that are associated to pancreatic cancer, right? Or the, the ones that are new, new cases of, of, of diabetes due to lifestyle. So I am happy to say like there are different projects, new projects that are going to be focusing on better understand the role of new onset diabetes and the group from a uh, different group, like a group from Liverpool, I think Costello is like a, a leading all these studies on early detection and we are working together and collaborating with her. Um, but also for um, people with some particular lesions in the pancreas, there are some kind of screening programs in these cases, but we don't have a screening program for people with vague symptoms. No, no. And, and I think, uh, yeah, so there's the Europac study, I yeah. think, might, yeah, yeah, the ones that are family history and chronic pancreatitis. And I'm sure we can um, let people know about, we can give the links to about all those yeah. things for people as well on the, on the chat or later on as well. And I just want to kind of, I suppose, um, I suppose it's useful for people to get a sense of like time scales. I think there's a great, really good question here from Alistair. Like we talk, quite abstractly about some of this stuff like what's your hope for time time scales on like actually achieving not necessarily you know that knockout test that all of a sudden revolutionize it but you know those pragmatic pragmatic new steps that will be actually maybe a bit under the radar but genuinely significant changes to the way people are diagnosed what do you hope is the, those first steps yeah so I think we are aiming at implementing, be able to implement a test uh, in the in, in secondary care or primary care, better understanding what type of test will be the best in, in both settings. But we are hoping the first thing to be able to initiate um, clinical studies. So clinical studies are key to ensure that the tests that we are developing in the lab using these samples are, um, are good enough, right, and accurate enough. So uh, what we will be applying for funding is to, to try to start these clinical trials in different places around the, the UK. So this will inform if the test need, needs any refinement, if we need mm -hmm. to go back and define better the markers. And, and you know, like, yeah, I, I think the dream and will be in the, the, the short term or middle <laughs> term, trying to be able to, to move forward the research that we're doing in the lab into the clinic. Yeah, I, I think we underestimate how um, important, but how difficult that that transition stage is. You, you know, you as a translational <laughs> researcher know just how difficult it is to take something out of the laboratory and put it into the clinic. But yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm kind of like hopeful that in the next few years, we'll like one or two years, we'll be getting into that stage where we're putting these tests in into and trialing them in the real world setting. So. Um, yeah, I hope yeah that and I think of... I think yeah for that is is uh, we are going back to to that like um, so we need we need panels that to implement to be implemented in the clinic that they are like ninety percent accurate and like and have a really 
good sensitivity and specificity for pancreatic cancer. So we really need to define well the markers that we are putting in there, and then we really need to design all together and, and be able to approve trials to test this in the vague symptoms population, because it's the one that is going to allow us valid validation. And as we mentioned before, these are the real patients we see, and this is where we, we need to, to go and, and better understand the how we implement the tool in the primary care and secondary care because the, the tool can be different and we really hope that you know we can run in the next few years a validation phase it will be really mm. really exciting yeah because especially in that primary care setting as well it's like it's about knowing what other you know gps have to do and test there's a really nice question here around how we train and help gps to to do this and i suppose these tests are giving them the options aren't like really the referral options those like then they may not be out and out detection tests, but their referrals, they can they can help them make a decision about what they do next. Isn't it really about again that pragmatism in the process? Yeah. So we are now trying uh, yeah, working together with GPs and I know also some uh, GPs, for example, Fiona Walter is also working with us and collaborating with us to better understand uh, or Julia Hipslikov from from Osfor. We have been working uh, together trying to understand the limitation challenges and, and how we can improve all these tools for GPs, which are key in this pathway. Yeah, absolutely key. Totally agree. The charity really recognizes that as well. I suppose um, there's a nice question here. Um, I suppose knowing a bit more about you, I suppose, Pilar, like you were incredibly motivated and dedicated in the space. I, I wanted to ask the question, like, why pancreatic cancer and why early detection you know as a basic researcher you've got the full gambit of molecular interactions to look at within lots of different conditions why why was it why was it pancreatic cancer and why was it early detection for you yeah nice question uh, yeah so as a cell biologist i you know i like all these complex as as you can imagine molecular mechanisms of disease and when i discovered pancreatic cancer already six years ago or even more, um, I was fascinated because it's a really complex disease and it's really, really clever. So it's a challenge and I, you know, I am curious as a scientist and, and I, I want, really wanted to better understand why this disease is so challenging. And I started with treatment and developing no, novel therapeutic strategies and models that are mimicking better the disease, obtaining samples from patients. And, and then I, when I joined UCL, um, my first, um, you know, um, opportunity to discover early detection was when Pancreatic Country UK came <laughs> to our lab uh, to talk to Professor Stephen Pereira about this alliance, and I, I was fascinated about, you know, how many researchers were in there, the multidisciplinarity, and I, you know, I just said, you know, I really would love to be part of it. Prof Professor Pereira has been really, really supportive. And then I, when I had the opportunity to work with, with you, with Pancreatic Cancer UK, and be in touch with patient groups, I think this is just fascinating. And yeah, now I have to say I have moved from treatment and the majority of my projects are now in early detection. And yeah, I am learning, learning a lot. And yeah, because I have realized it's key. It's, it's really, really key. We detect, if we are able to detect the disease earlier, we can offer patients better treatment. So it's, there is also a link between the two areas of research. So yeah, I really love it now. <laughs> no, good. I mean, it's really obvious as well, Pilar, that you are like in, in great affinity towards your cause and the cause of pancreatic cancer as well. I suppose like where, I, I mean, professionally and personally, where would you like to, where would you like to see the early detection community in a few years time? Where would you, where you think those gains will be made and what would you, you know, what would you like to be able to kind of look back on and, you know, hang your hat on and go like, actually that was something that we, either I or my team or, you know, the community did and that, that was really meaningful. Yeah, I always, I'm always going to say this is a huge effort. So it's all the community of, of pancreatic cancer researchers, but yeah, we love to see this test implemented, all the trials ongoing, right? Like, Honestly, been working in the lab years after years and discovering these markers, seeing them developing a test that is really helping patients and that we can use this test in the clinic. A patient is coming to us, we can explain them why we do this. And then we can give them an answer quick, quicker and then 
that we can have an impact on the outcomes of these patients, I think, what else can you ask for, right? I mean, I think as a scientist will be the best, uh, the best that we can get. So we really like to see all these type of projects where, you know, you put together and you, you, all, you force kind of researchers to work together from different areas of expertise, because it's always easier to work and to keep yourself in your area of expertise. You, need, you have your niche and you just continue doing what you are doing, but trying to understand others, trying to explain what you do to others and why this is important, I think is key. And also, you know, I would like to see, and I, I love to see that your charity is supporting um, early career researchers to continue doing what we do because without your support and the support of your of the community that is here joining us uh, we will not be able to to continue what we do so yeah thank you yeah and I suppose to maybe just to ask you know just to turn over that stone a little more in that like do you think that the early diagnosis research alliance does it has brought in new people into the into the world of pancreatic cancer. Do you think it's given them the opportunity to, you know, catch, you know, the feelings that you do about your work and like why this is so important as well? Like I know that you've been involved in some of the, the you know, the um, the online um, workshop stuff that we did with CRUK and the EPSRC. Mm. I just wondered if you thought, you know, you genuinely seen people coming into the field now as a result of some of this funding. Yes, 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 totally. So first, for example, starting more specifically in our team, we are offering uh, projects for BSc students, master's students, PhD students, right, to join the early detection um, community. And, you know, a lot of them were coming like me, more focused on, on treatment, because a lot of funding has been going to um, treatment strategies, but, you know, they, I think they really see how relevant it is going with us to summits as you are organizing and then explaining the project that we are having, for example, like, and also during the summit that you mentioned together with CRUK, I met there are people coming from epidemiology or people experts on, on brain cancer or statistical analysis, AI, but they didn't, they didn't know anything about early detection of pancreatic cancer even less. So mm. this is fascinating and, and you learn a lot. They see this uh, with an, another, with different eyes. And then also I am really uh, pleased to say, I, I, I also got funding uh, from MRC, CRUK, PCRC to work in a, in a primary care project. And this is totally new for me. And without this, you know, I will, I will not be exploring how to work with the primary care. So it's kind of fascinating, yeah. Fascinating is the word. Um, unfortunately, um, my colleagues are doing the virtual kind of stop, Chris. You, uh, you can't keep on asking Pilar any more questions. So I will have to wrap it up. I was just wondering if you had any final kind of and uh, final words for our attendees before I kind of wrap up. For sure, yes. Yes, as I mentioned before, I cannot thank you all uh, enough. Um, because without your support, I will not be here. My team will not be able to be doing what we are doing. The alliance will not be a reality. And I think it's not only important for us as junior investigators. So I want to see ourselves as the future of early detection, but also for all, putting all these groups together, right? Which is a challenge and we manage. And I think, you know, hopefully we can continue doing so. So thank you, thank you so much for your support. And yeah, and to Pancreatic Country UK, and of course for joining us today. And I hope we can meet in person soon at one of the summits. Yeah, I really yeah. miss that. <laughs> Absolutely. No, here, here, here to that. Um, and <laughs> thank you so much, Pilar, your, for today, for your work and your dedication. It just has sung through today and it's been a joy having this conversation with you. So thank you so much for all your work. Um, and I would just like to extend my thanks to everyone who joined us today and everyone who supported the double donation campaign. It really has made an incredible difference for early detection research and people like Pilar. So thank you so, so much. Um, there is a survey that will follow this as we close, and we really, really appreciate you to just quickly fill in that survey, just so we can get the feedback in order to improve our the way we do these things in the future. But for now, from me and from Pilar, thank you so much for coming along, and we hope to see you soon. Uh, thank you. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>